All right, we've been following along with Jesus as he's beginning his ministry. And today we're going to look at the first miracle that Jesus performed. And we're told about it by the author, the Apostle of John. In John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. And here's what he says. In the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour is not yet come. His mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he says unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins, that be about eighteen to twenty-seven gallons apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw it out now, and bring it to the governor of the feast. And they brought it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not where it came from, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning sets forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. And so we begin um, in this, as John says, and the third day. Now, this is in reference, yes, to what he had just talked about um, and the, the gathering of the followers and um, what we talked about last week. But at the same time, John is very intentional. He says very clearly in the end of his gospel, he's chosen to record what he has very intentionally for the purpose that you would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And in believing, you would have life in his name. And so this mention of the third day is intentional. And I think it's meant to set the stage by John of what this miracle symbolizes. John, the third day throughout the Bible signifies a new beginning and a new life. And that's exactly what Jesus is going to do, is he's going to take inorganic you know, matter and he's going to take a naturally organic process of fermentation that would happen with grapes. But he's going to speed up the process, showing himself to be the, the Lord of nature. And he's going to perform a miracle of transformation. And that, and no less, new wine. And Jesus used that imagery to convey what he was doing in the gospel. That, that he was bringing new wine. And so John is setting the stage here. And then we go on. There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And it's interesting, just as a side note, that John always refers to Mary as the mother of Jesus. And in fact, uh, Mary's not really mentioned. Uh, you have the birth narratives and then you have after or when Jesus is um, crucified and then buried, resurrected, and she comes back into the scene at that point, and some of his brothers do at that point too. But in between, there's hardly any mentions of Mary, and John specifically always refers to her as the mother of Jesus. And uh, it's assumed that... This was the wedding of somebody related to Mary, and that's because everybody wants to explain a lot of the unexplained things, or at least from a certain vantage point, they're unexplained. Like, why is Mary the one who is dealing with this problem? And so they assume that it needed to be somebody that she was related to, and then that way she would have charge of some of the affairs. But let me ask you this. How many of you in this room have a mom who just takes things upon herself and makes them her problem even though it's not her responsibility anybody in this room have a mom like that i my hand is raised my mom would totally just take charge if there was some kind of problem 
and she would make it her problem. And maybe Mary was just like that. Um, there's a lot of conjecture and explanations. And when you go through and study this passage and why did they do this and why did they do that? And we need to just let the text speak for itself. And when it's silent, just let it be silent. And um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of those things. But I don't think that she needed to be related in order for her to try and take this issue on herself. And so going on in verse 2, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Jesus was invited to the wedding. And uh, if this was a relative of Mary, that would explain why Jesus was invited. But I want to point out something, that Jesus accepted the invitation. And being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that you become the downer. And a lot of people have a hesitation to accepting Christianity because Christians sometimes have a reputation of just being like rule keepers or rule makers. Or, you know, just we have standards that you can't do this and you've got to do this. And... A lot of people have this conception that Christianity is just not any fun. That it just becomes this rigid, you know, pious life that you kind of go about and do your thing. But that old, you know, having a good time and going to parties and enjoying yourself, those days are over. And that's just not the case. Now, part of the problem is that... <clears throat> There's a conception out there that in order to have fun, you have to sin. And I want you to notice something about Jesus as we go through the Gospels. is that Jesus was really attractive to sinners. They wanted Jesus around. They liked Jesus being around. They invited him and his followers to joyous occasions. They invited him to occasions even when they were going to be sinning. There was something about Jesus and his way of doing things and his way of relating to people that he was a likable guy. I think Jesus had a great sense of humor. I think that he was easy to be around. I don't think that he always made religion the issue. I think that, um, but the misconception is that you have to sin in order to have fun. Jesus was at the wedding. He was invited to these kind of things. And he had fun. He enjoyed himself. Yet he didn't have to sin in order to do that. And in fact, he influenced the sinners and made them want to be like him. Made them want what he had to give them. And so Jesus was invited to the wedding, but um, and many wedding ceremonies actually point out that this was an endorsement by Jesus of marriage. The fact that he accepted the invitation and he came is, in fact, an endorsement by Jesus of marriage, which was instituted by God in the Garden of Eden between Adam and Eve. But I want to point out something that's even more interesting, and that's the disciples of Jesus were invited. And this is something that would catch you off guard. Now, imagine that you invited me even to officiate your wedding. Okay? And um, I'm there and I'm, you know, scheduled to perform the vows. But when I come and I show up, I show up with like several of you from the church. And you just come with me. And you fully expect to attend the reception and to eat and to drink that would catch us off guard. Why? Because we weren't personally invited. I, you hired me as an officiant to do your wedding. And then all of a sudden, I just took it upon myself to show up with these guys. And I, I listened to a couple of people who actually painted this picture as if that's what's going on here. That, you know, the disciple Jesus and the disciples were almost like wedding crashers. And... The only problem with that, you know, because that would explain a lot in this text, you know, it would explain why, 
you know, Mary's making it Jesus' problem that they ran out of wine. And, you know, like you guys aren't even supposed to be here and you're eating and you're drinking all their stuff. And now they've run out and like, this is your problem. Now fix it. It would explain that kind of stuff. But the only problem with that view is that the text says that they were invited. And when the Bible says that they're invited, I kind of just assume that they were. Now, let me just um, bring up this scenario, though. And this paints a picture for us a little bit about Jesus' mentality towards his disciples. These weren't just students of his. You know, he wasn't just a professor who came into a classroom where students were assembled and parted a bunch of knowledge and then left and they went off and had separate lives. Jesus very much saw his responsibility as providing for the needs of his followers. And that's still true today. Jesus sees it as his responsibility to take care of you if you're his followers. But when Jesus RSVP'd, you know, and I'm using a lot of modern day language to help us understand this. Now, of course, they, they probably didn't have RSVP, but were his followers already invited? Were they initially invited? Or was it something like, or did he say, I'd love to come, but my followers will be coming with me. Is that okay? And on the inviting party's end, was it just a polite yes? You know, you know what I'm talking about? You know, like when somebody just totally invites themselves and other people into the situation and then you kind of feel this responsibility to say, yeah, that's okay. But really inside you're panicking because you don't have enough food and you're worried about that and all that kind of stuff. I'm wondering what the scenario was here. And I, I just wanted to talk about a brief rabbit trail here on evangelism. Something that I've come to realize. Now, now, last week, I had you raise your hands if you came to faith in Jesus as a result of a friend, family member, or somebody that was close to you actually sharing the gospel with you or inviting you to church or, you know, playing a very significant role in that process. And almost all of you raised your hands. And it showed that the, the norm is that that's how it works, that the gospel travels through relational streams. But I want to emphasize the other end is okay too. That there's some of you, and I'm actually in this camp, um, there's some of you who are just fine at sharing the gospel with strangers. You know, you're prone to want to just go out in handout tracks or go out witnessing in very public places like college campuses or malls or parks or things like that. And you're just absolutely fine with that. I, I did a lot of that when I was in college. I, I did open air preaching. I did a lot of things that people would just generally be uncomfortable doing in the name of evangelism. And honestly, my thought when we moved out to Utah uh, several years ago as, as missionaries, my thought was that I was going to be doing a whole lot of that stuff. And in fact, I had probably, we lived in probably one of the best places in all of Utah to do that because they held this huge uh, pageant where, you know, thousands upon thousands of people would come and there would be lots of opportunities to witness on the streets and all that kind of stuff. And I thought that's what I was going to be doing. I thought I was going to be going to places like that where there was lots of people and I was going to be sharing my faith like that. And when we got there, God actually says, don't, he just, we just felt him saying, don't do that. Just stop and I'll give you instructions as to what I want you to do. And what ended up happening is that because we chose not to participate in some of those types of activities, our neighbor, who was previously closed off to having a lot of conversations about um, our faith and the differences in our faith, she actually came over after the fact and she talked to me. 
And from that point on, we started striking up this relationship. We started having conversations. She attended the Bible study that we had in our homes a couple of times. And more than that, she started inviting me into other kind of conversations. She arranged for the Mormon missionaries to come over to our house and talk to us. She invited me to a state conference event. And it was amazing because I went with them and here she was. She was taking me around the room and introducing me and who I was to all of her LDS friends, to her bishop, to the different bishops in that state. Um, and I was able to have these conversations and it set the stage for future conversations. And it hit me that I was invited to the party. I was invited into this conversation. And there's a huge difference. And I think about that scenario, that particular state conference that I went to. That's the type of event that a lot of Christians would come and crash. Okay? And they would just start sharing their faith and witnessing outside of it. And they were known as protesters. And the difficulty and the, the trying to force conversations in that type of venue and how people look at you and the things they say to you when you do it and the contrast that I was on the inside with an LDS family being introduced by them to other prominent LDS people in the community. And such a contrast when you're invited when it happens naturally, when it happens relationally, the doors swing wide open for evangelism. And sometimes the best thing that we can do is just build bridges for the gospel and just listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit and allowing Him to take us into those opportunities that we pray that God would give us the opportunities and we're sensitive for when they show up. And we're ready when they show up. But we don't try and force his hand. Or don't try and force the situation. He will provide the means for you to share your faith. And so going on to verse 3. Jesus said, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. I just want to say something here. Let the Bible answer its own questions. I mentioned how this particular passage has led to all sorts of conjectures and rabbit trails and all sorts of stuff that go on um, when you read the commentaries or listen to sermons as I have been this week on this passage and trying to study it. They're asking all sorts of questions, you know, like, why was Jesus invited to the wedding? And were the disciples invited to the wedding? And was Mary a relative of somebody who... And why was Mary dealing with all this stuff? All these things that they want answered. But here's the thing. More often than not, the Bible answers its the own questions that it raises. And let me just paint this scenario. If you just, again, picture a modern wedding reception... Usually they have tables set up and they usually the, the bride and the groom, they kind of arrange people, you know, relationally. And so you have families sitting together and all that kind of stuff. Now, just imagine that scenario and think about it this way. Jesus and his disciples, they show up at, to the wedding, the wedding ceremony, the wedding celebration. And they show up late. They're obviously late because they've already run out of wine when, as soon as they ask. But here's the deal. I picture them seated at the same table as Mary. Okay, so Mary is Jesus' mother. And so I picture that his brothers were probably there too. Um, so they, they come, Jesus and his disciples, they're at the same, they're, they're with Mary. She's right there. They're gathering their food. And then some of his disciples say, hey, um, where's the wine? And Mary, hearing them, says, they have no wine.
And so the Bible answers the, his own questions. Mary just very naturally responds because of her proximity. She wasn't necessarily like trying to take charge of the event or trying to solve this problem. She just flat out responds and says, they have no wine. Now, what happens afterwards is what leads me to believe that there was something more to what she was saying. In verse 4, Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with you? Now, was Jesus disrespectful? You know, some of you just ducked on Jesus' behalf when he said that. You're thinking, whoa, okay, I, if I ever said that to my mom, then I would get smacked upside the head and I would be set straight really quick. Let me just... In, let me just say this, that this was actually a term of respect, okay? It doesn't come across that way in our English Bibles, but Jesus, all throughout the Gospel of John especially, he's constantly referring to women as woman. He's saying it constantly, and in fact, from the cross, he says this to his mom, and when he's trying to get John uh, to take care of her. Okay, it was obviously a moment in which he was being very respectful and he was caring very much for his mom. He says the exact same thing. So what have I to do with you? Um, basically would be like, why is this my problem? <laughs> if you can ask, if you can say it that way. Jesus wasn't being disrespectful. He was just pointing out something that, okay, we have no wine. And maybe it was a way that Mary said it. And maybe, okay, so a couple of scenarios. Mary didn't think it was a good idea for Jesus to bring his followers. I mean, that's very possible. And I could see a mom having that kind of posture. Like, Jesus, you know, like, this is more of like a, a, a family thing, okay? You, you shouldn't have brought those guys. I, I get it that you have this ministry and they're following you and you feel this responsibility, but the, this isn't their problem, Jesus. You know, th this isn't the bride and groom's problem that they, they need to feed and, and, and supply for the needs of your followers. You shouldn't have brought them, Jesus. I could very well see that. And something in her voice saying, you know, they have no wine, Jesus. And you brought some extra guests, so um, why don't you do something about it? But um, I, I think scenario number two, Mary was expecting Jesus to do something. And I think that this is more likely the, the tone in what Jesus heard her saying. Like, you know, this is the same Mary who was there during all the birth stuff. When angels were showing up and kings from the east and um, all of these things, prophets and prophetesses. And it says that she pondered all these things in her heart way back when. 30 years have passed. And now she hears about what has happened in his baptism. And the heavens opening and the voice of God coming from heaven. The, the Holy Spirit remaining upon him. She's heard about all these things. Now he starts to have followers. And she may have been throwing out there, Hey Jesus, perfect opportunity. They have no wine. What are you going to do about it, Jesus? And there's something in her, uh, in what Jesus responds that tells me that Mary was expecting something amazing to happen, just like at his baptism. That Jesus would do something about this and everybody would just realize who he was and that this miraculous following would occur. And, you know, maybe she even believed the common conception that, you know, just like the angel said to her, that he will sit on the throne of his father, David. And maybe she was thinking, you know, hey, if you can just impress these people, if you can just show them what you can do, you can gain a following, you can overthrow Rome, you can fulfill all the expectations of all these people, and it can happen right now, Jesus. And Jesus just simply replied, My hour is not yet come. 
And, you know, some people think that he, he's referring to, like, it's not time for me to do miracles. But that's actually not what he was referring to, because what does he do, turn right around and do? He performs a miracle. And unless Jesus just literally, like when Mary said that, he said, oh, Father hasn't said it's okay. Then, you know, like 30 minutes passes and then, the whole, you know, the Father says, hey, by the way, go do that. And he's kind of like, well, that's kind of embarrassing because I just kind of made it sound like you hadn't told me to do that. Now you're telling me to do that. And, but that's not what he's saying. If you follow this phrase through the Gospel of John, my hour has not yet come. The hour is referring to his death. And so as you go on from the go here to the Gospel of John, he says, an hour is coming. And he says that a few times. An hour is coming. And then it talks about how people tried to kill him, but he escaped because his hour had not yet come. And then in John chapter 12, something shifts. And all of a sudden Jesus says, the hour has now come. For this cause I came unto this hour. So Jesus was referring to his death. And Mary possibly thought that, you know, what Jesus came to do was something completely different. And so, uh, so in verse 5, his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. I think this is brilliant advice. <laughs> this is, you know, if you just apply this statement by Mary to your Christian life. And in fact, this can be like a, a brief explanation of Christianity. Whatever Jesus says, do it. In fact, that's how Jesus lived his life as one of us. He says, whatever the Father tells me to do, that's what I do. Whatever I see him doing, that's what I do. Whatever I hear him say, that's what I say. That's exactly how Jesus lived his life. That's exactly how we can live our life. Whatever he says to you, do it. Now, do it because you love him, not because you have to. Because why you do what you do is just as important as what you do. And in fact, it's more important than what you do. Jesus, over and over, the prophets, over and over, Call this to realize that God looks at the heart, not what we're doing, not the outward sacrifice or ritual or action. God looks at the heart. Why you do what you do is more important than what you do. And whatever he calls you to do, he will supply both the opportunity and the means. That means he will supply the desire. He will supply the motive. He will supply the power to carry it out. And I'll say this. If you struggle with the desire to do it, ask him to change your desires. And what, here's what that looks like. Be honest with him about how you really feel. And tell him, I really struggle with the desire. I know that this is what you want me to do. And I'm just going to tell you flat out, I really don't want to do it. And here's why. And then, but admit that there is a conflict in you, that there's a part of you that really wants to do it because you, you want to show him that you love him, that you want to, you want to be obedient and you want to follow through on what he's called you to do, but you struggle because there's a conflict there. And then just ask him to resolve the conflict within you. To provide you with the desire to do what he's called you to do. To work out that conflict. And so verse 6. It says, And there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins, that's about 18 to 27 gallons, apiece. Jesus said unto them, Fill the water pots with water. <clears throat> and they filled them up to the brim. And he said unto them, Draw it out now and bring it to the governor of the feast. And they brought it. My question is, what kind of vessel are you? 
I, I find it really interesting, and I, I think that John mentions this on purpose, because I think he saw a, a meaning behind what Jesus chose to do to resolve this issue. He took the water pots that usually were used for washing your hands before ceremonial, ritual, religious ceremonies. Okay? And what I want you to notice is that he had to have them fill the pots with water. The pots were empty because this was a celebration. This wasn't a religious ritual. And so they didn't even bother filling these water pots. Religion often doesn't show up at celebration. And I want you to notice that. Religion doesn't usually mix with celebration. And so there's a vessel of ritual and religion. And Jesus transforms it into a vessel of grace. A vessel of generosity. A vessel of the miraculous. A vessel of transformation. And he says, fill them up with what they're normally filled with. Okay, just take what they're normally filled with. And I just hear, come as you are. Right now, you're a vessel of ritual. Maybe right now, you're a vessel of atheism, of just I, godlessness. Fill it up with what they're normally filled with. And then Jesus transformed the vessel of ritual into a vessel of grace. I want you to picture the contrast here. You're out of wine. Want to wash your hands? Or, you're out of wine. Want some better wine? How about 150 more gallons of better wine? Yeah, Jesus made about 150 gallons of wine. And a point in the, the wedding celebration that they would have been kind of, sort of, probably wrapping it up. Jesus says, how about 150 more gallons of wine? Jesus doesn't just fill them with what they need. Jesus overflows them with new wine. Jesus overflows them with the best Grace and grace solves problems without ever fighting the problem. And it solves problems faster. You know, some of you are really concerned. And I know that you're concerned because I have Facebook too. <laughs> and I hear the conversations and I go to men's breakfast. And... I know that you are very concerned about the state of our country. Different issues that you're concerned with, that our, our country has gone just haywire in. You're looking at the options in front of you for the next election, and you're just throwing your hands up and saying, I, I can't, I, I don't know what to do. Let me, let me share with you a plan. If you're looking at this next election and throwing your hands up and saying, there is no good option, why don't you spend the next four years sharing the gospel? Why don't you spend the next four years talking about Jesus, talking about grace, and sharing that with people, and calling them into an invitation of relationship with Him, instead of spending the next four years getting on your soapbox about this issue, and that candidate, 
and what he said versus what he said and what this guy did. Imagine what could happen in our country if for the next four years every Christian devoted themselves to sharing Jesus and sharing grace. The chances that we would all replicate ourselves just, just once is probably pretty good. And think about what that does to the people to the people who are voting. Think about what it does to the likelihood that God's going to raise up a godly man to lead this country and to sit on the Supreme Court and to be in different offices of government. The likelihood actually goes up that righteousness can come back to this country if we actually just focus on the gospel and let God change the hearts of the people in this country. That when they come to him, that he will take care of all the other stuff. Okay, I, I'm on rabbit trails today, but here we go. Verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not where it came from, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and said unto him, Every man at the beginning sets forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus and Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. The best is found in Jesus. And I'm starting to see a theme in John. Last week we were in John and he ended by saying to Nathaniel, you will see better things than this. And now we come to this passage and we have the master of the feast, the guy who is in charge of preparing everything and taking care of everything. And he says, you've saved the good wine until the end. And I'm starting to see a theme here. And, and in the verses to come, I started noticing how Jesus is saying, an hour is coming. The hour is coming. Everything in the Gospels points forward and says this, whether this right now is good or bad, then will be better. Then will be better. Better things are yet to come. The good wine God's kept till the end. Everything you need is in Jesus. And if you came here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you can settle that word from where you're sitting between you and him in your own words right now. You can just reach out to him and say, God, I know that I am a sinner I know, but I believe that you died for my sins and you rose again from the dead. And so, Lord, forgive me, save me, and change me. Come and live inside of me and change me from the inside out. I want to follow you. And it's not the words that you say, but it's the heart that says it, the heart that believes it. And if you believe that, I promise you that he will meet you where you're at. And we just encourage you, if you do that, to tell somebody we want to be there to help you on your next step of faith and your your journey and whatever that means. And uh, so, But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, just be encouraged. Let me ask you something. Are you a vessel of ritual and religion or are you a vessel of grace? Either way, just know you're a vessel. That's all you are. You don't have the power, the ability, or anything intrinsically in you to do anything. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. But in Christ, God can do all things. What is impossible with me. Is possible with God. Whatever it is that you're facing, 
whatever it is he's calling you to do, know this. If you have Christ, you have everything you need. And more. Amen.